Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Rodriguez, and welcome to our session for the Certificate Program in Practice-Based Research Methods. The virtual session is facilitated by Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared Network of Virtual Training Series funded by AHRQ. Um, this gives you live access to the curriculum and speakers as part of the certificate program developed by Dr. James Werner and support from the AHRQ PBRNs of Excellence. Um, a few guidelines for the session today. Um, if you're entering through the phone bridge, kindly put it on mute. Um, on the left-hand side of the Blackboard portal, you'll have the option to click the raise your hand icon to ask questions. The speaker can then call on you, um, and you will need to unmute your phone. If you're having any technical difficulties with audio or viewing the presentation, you can double click on CDN Help and enter your questions directly into the chat box. And a recording of today's session will be provided by the course administrator. And at this time, I will hand it over to Dr. James Werner. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. Um, um, it's my great uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce our presenters for today uh, for the presentation entitled Preparing a Research Paper for Publication, an incredibly important topic for everybody. First, um, Dr. Victoria Neal is a professor and vice chair of public health sciences in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health Sciences at Wayne State University in Detroit. She's also the deputy editor of the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine, the JABFM, uh, by the way, which publishes a great deal of uh, our practice-based research studies. And um, she is the editor of Family Practice, the International Journal of Research for Research in Primary Care, which is published by the Oxford University Press. How she's able to do all these things and still be a professor and vice chair, I have no idea. She must not sleep very much. But Dr. Neal, thank you so much for being here today. Um, sure. Um, next, I'll introduce Dr. Julianne Benyenda, who will be presenting with Dr. Neal. Uh, Dr. Benyenda is an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health Sciences at Wayne State University in Detroit. She is a member and fellow of the editorial board for the Society for Teachers of Family Medicine National Clerkship, Clerkship Curriculum. She is also a frequent reviewer for the MedEd portal and other family medicine journals. So Dr. Neal and Dr. Binyenda, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here with Victoria Neal, and we're going to be discussing dissemination of your practice-based research projects. Not only is the work you are beneficial to your patients, but it should be shared with your colleagues who can then apply the study outcomes in their own patient and healthcare institutions. The most effective method for dissemination is through peer-reviewed publications. In our time together today, I'm going to begin by presenting on alternative methods for publishing. These may include digital portals and other web-based, practice-based research dissemination tools. Victoria will then follow me, presenting on the more detailed and technical aspects of preparing manuscripts for submission to the more traditional peer-reviewed publications. We welcome your questions and comments, and we will leave plenty of time at the end to respond. To Alternative publishing sources are predominantly digital portals or gateways offered by various specialties to allow their members and or the public to access medical education, evidence-based medical practices, practice-based learning, and other methods for learning the competencies and milestones. If you are working with residents or students on any practice-based research projects, these portals or gateways can be used to disseminate not only the project, but your mentoring of the, the learner. I have a few examples listed here, and I will describe each one briefly. There are many, many more. Please remember, and I'm cautioning also, to seek only those that are peer-reviewed. This not only benefits you, but more importantly, the study or project that you've worked very hard on. The first one I'm going to discuss is the Society Teaches a Family Medicine, uh, Family Medicine Digital Resource Library, the SMDRL. This was developed in an open standards-based infrastructure. It permits interaction with other digital libraries. The idea is to share and collaborate 
any development of ideas that you have and including research. It includes content for all levels of family medicine education, any kind of conference presentation, handouts, PowerPoints, uh, video files, anything. Materials can be uploaded without peer review as placeholders that your colleagues can have access to and you can share and network with them. Again, we recommend the peer review option, which we believe is a critical part of the functioning of the scientific community, more specifically for quality control and the self-corrected nature of our work in science. It also provides academic development of our learners, those we're mentoring, the residents that perhaps many of us work with. MedEd Portal is sponsored by the AAMC, Association of American Medical Colleges. This is a free platform for health educators to build, share, elevate, access high quality teaching materials. There are a few different aspects of the MedEd Portal. The publications sections are all peer-reviewed, they're health education and assessment tools. Again, if you wish to publish your practice-based research findings to a broader audience of medical educators, this is the venue. There's also a separate storage house of peer-reviewed assessment tools. Expert reviewers conduct systematic reviews of a particular assessment tool, and it is housed then in this MedEd portal. Authors are provided a structured template to fulfill the peer review specification. iCollaborative is a non-peer reviewed storage warehouse. Presentations, videos, educational sessions. The purpose again is to exchange ideas and further collaboration among healthcare professionals. The continuing education directory is to promote the availability of accredited continuing education activities in the support of patient care, lifelong learning, relicensure, and maintenance of certification goals. Some of these have charges associated with them depending on the institution who submitted the activity. It does provide practicing health professionals with the ability to quickly search, find, and access high quality accredited online courses. Here's a, a web shot for you. Uh, that includes, you can see the MedEd portal publications, iCollaborative, and the continuing education directory. It offers a broad uh, suite, if you will, of services, and you can see the um, URL listed there as well. We provided this for you so you can poke around yourself and take a look. Wanted to discuss some of these others because you may run across them, and be. I wanted you to be fully aware of what they offer and some of their strengths and weaknesses. Merlot, in this case, is not a wine. Um, it stands for Multimedia Educational Resource for Learning and Online Teaching. The goal is to provide efficient access to education materials. Merlot does not host materials on this site. It provides links to the sites that host the material. There is no external peer reviews. There are two internal reviewers who are academic professionals. They assess the submissions and then put them up there. Um, I've reviewed some of these. Again, you could use them more for reference or to see what's being done in terms of practice-based research, um, and particularly in the educational arena, teaching residents about these concepts. Uh, you could. Again, search some of that, but again, just as a reminder, for you to submit your own, it's not peer reviewed. MedEd World, you may have heard about. This takes the MedEd portal broader. It's Association for Medical Education in Europe. Amy sponsors this. Uh, create an international online community. Materials are screened, not peer reviewed. Again, we just wanted to make you aware of some of these alternative dissemination venues for your research, but we want to stress the importance of peer-reviewed publishing venues, including these online portals, as the best choice for your scholarship. And more importantly, for you to mentor your residents and students to also follow peer-reviewed publishing venues 
uh, the more younger learners love poking around online and finding all of these interesting sites. Uh, your job and our job is to make sure that they're using the more proper peer-reviewed venues for that. I'm going to now turn the reins over to Victoria Neal, who's going to review the more formal recommendations for publishing your research in the more traditional journal format. Okay, Victoria. Okay, thank you, Julianne. It's kind of exciting to learn about these other alternative strategies besides the traditional peer review journals, which I'm going to talk about. That's, that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, so I know that we have a variety of um, people here in this program with different levels of experience publishing. So I'm going to try to move quickly through a lot of the more basic things. Um, and if there's questions, I'd be very happy to um, respond at the end. So peer-reviewed journals, I call it journal boot camp basics. So I, I want to also throw in the, you know, some of my, just my personal, like, um, peccadillos <laughs> or, or as an editor, you know, the things that are important to me. So the basics, um, ideally you should plan your publications when you start your study or, or even when you're planning your study. Um, I know this, but do I follow my own advice? Not, not as well as I should. Um, the problem is some, if you don't really think about your publication in the really early stages of your research, at the end you'll find that, oh my gosh, I need to control for some confounding variable or I need a covariate and I forgot to, I never thought to collect the data on it. And so that's really the, the basic reason why it's really useful to really think ahead what, what would your papers be about and um, try to think that every, every study you want to plan at least two publications to come out of it. That's, that's kind of my rule of thumb. Um, also to identify author teams, and I'm going to come back and, and circle back around to authorship in a minute. Um, select a journal that you're going to target. Uh, there's so many, there's thousands of journals out there now. We all know the basic ones in our field, um, but they're proliferating all the time and uh, you also want to think about what are the best journals for you. Uh, avoid the so-called predatory journals. Uh, again, I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Um, so how do you know about what journals would be appropriate to publish in? Um, what I do is look at the references in the studies that I'm reading, my own literature review. Uh, get some ideas of what's out there. And also just, you know, go, go, we don't go to the library the way we used to and walk through the stacks, but you, you can peruse the, the issues um, through PubMed as well. Just to see what are they publishing, are they publishing something similar to what I want to do? Um, now caveat to that is if they just published what I'm doing last month, they're probably not going to publish it again, even though it's a really good study. So you do have to, you know, keep in mind these checks and balances for selecting the, run, the, the best journal. <coughs> so I would say also that you want to be aware of what editors expect from authors and be familiar with the uh, ICMJE author guidance. That's the International Committee um, of Medical Journal Editors. That's an association and organization that, that promulgates um, guidelines and standards for, for publishing. And this is really the editor's handbook, so you want to know what the editors want you to know and what the editors are thinking. It's really, I can't stress strongly enough that you should take a look at this. Um, so you want to know what, what editors want from you. You want to read their instructions to authors and avoid sending frivolous emails to editors asking, do you think your journal wants to publish my paper? Uh, you can usually answer that yourself if you read the instructions to authors and look at what the journal is publishing. And always submit your best work. Don't rush to submit something. Polish it. Let it sit for a day or two. Go back and all the, a lot of typos will jump out at you, that kind of thing. Um, show that you are capable of um, producing a you know, publication quality article upon your first submission. Um, be aware of publication ethics, publishing ethics. You know, what do you need to do? You, you want to include a statement in your paper that your um, study had IRB approval or was exempt from an IRB approval, some kind of a statement about IRB patient consent. If you're, if you're doing anything that involves 
like a case study, be sure you get the patient consent while they're still living and breathing in the hospital before they get discharged and you don't know where they are. Um, we've had a lot of issues with that. that um, people think, oh, I just saw this really interesting patient and interesting case, I'm going to write a case report, and then it takes them a year to do it, and they never thought to get the patient's permission. Um, also get permission, think about if you're going to adapt uh, figures from another journal that you'll need to get permissions for the figures from the uh, copyright holder. Um, so all these things, being aware of all these things when you submit your paper builds confidence in the editorial team that you can produce a good quality manuscript. Because it's not always just about was it a good study, but it's about is it a good study plus can you provide and uh, produce a, a good quality manuscript. Okay, so we, we sent some resources last week. I think you have um, the links or the PDFs to these. I use these in my teaching a lot and I really like them, so I just wanted to let you know about them as well. The Bordage paper is, it's an older publication, but a lot of these things, you know, they're, it's like statistics, they don't really change that much. Um, so the Bordage paper, I'm preparing a, a paper for publication, gives a really good outline of the key elements you want to address in your publication. It also helps you actually plan your studies to make sure that you're covering all the bases. Uh, the Roberts paper is, the title is, is something about um, for peer reviewers, but it's really good for authors as well because um, once again you want to produce a paper that will um, pass muster with the peer reviewers. So you, you need to know what they're going to be looking for. And then as I already said, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, their recommendations is really the editor's handbook. So I guess I got ahead of myself. but. Um, once again, the Bordage paper, I'll just keep going. Here, here's a screenshot of the Roberts paper. It's a little bit hard to find. Uh, that's why I provided this URL and checklist. Not one of those things that is easily retrieved. And then the ICMJE recommendations, which as you know already, I love. Uh, this is what their website looks like, the home page, and it's on the middle of the left here where it says download that aqua colored button, that, that downloads the recommend. What's in these recommendations, again, they tell what editors expect from authors, um, instructions for submitting the manuscript, and they, most importantly, things that people might be less familiar with is they, they give a lot of editorial policy statements related to conflict of interest, corrections and retractions, confidentiality, so on and so forth. So authorship uh, from the ICMJE, the authorship criteria, and these are, these are them. Uh, the authors have to meet all three of these criteria, and I will say I admit that I know that a lot of times authors on papers don't meet all these criteria, um, but it, nevertheless it's a good standard to strive for, and uh, it's very useful to introduce these criteria into conversations with your author groups. And if people have questions on authorship, a lot of times they've got these weird war stories or shaggy dog stories, but <laughs> I'll, I'll let, let, let that go to the end in case people want to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I say the sticky is issue of authorship because these are very sensitive discussions. They're very uncomfortable discussions. I've had a lot of people come to me with unhappiness about how authorship is worked out. Uh, and um, so I just want to acknowledge that these are difficult conversations and the best thing I might be able to, uh, advice I might be able to give is to bring up these, bring up the topic early, revisit it uh, periodically, like who's an author on this paper, because sometimes, oftentimes it takes really a long time to publish a paper. So you start, you conceive a study, you get funding for the study, you conduct the study, you analyze your data, you start writing your paper. So usually a few years have gone by and the people who might have been in on the ground floor may or may not still be around or may or may not still have the time or interest to participate. Um, so again, as people might come and go, uh, discuss the division of labor, who's, you know, who's going to do what, like who's going to write the methods section, who's going to write the results section, that kind of thing. What, what is the time commitment, um, order of authorship, you know, the first author does the heavy lifting and the, the last author is sometimes referred to as the senior author. That's also kind of an honor, honorific position indicating 
a substantial contribution. Um, and then who's in the middle? <laughs> so that's something to talk about. And, and again, as people's commitments and interests ebb and flow, your authorship group might change. So it's just something, if, if you br the more often you bring it up, the easier it is to have these conversations, I would say. But I do acknowledge that it's a little bit difficult. Um, OK, so getting into just the key elements of the manuscripts, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but this is kind of a list of the, the things that every paper needs. Um, we talk about the IMRAD format. IMRAD is the introduction methods, results, and discussion. And most papers are organized this way. You know, scientific writing is a, is a particular type of writing. Um, it's not journalism. It's not essays. It's not creative writing, which are all wonderful, legitimate venues. But this is a little bit more formulaic, which actually makes it easier. A lot of people think, oh, I don't know how to write. That's why I went into science. But um, you can't be a good scientist if you can't publish your work. Um, but thankfully, we have this formula, this IMRAD format that we follow. And it, it breaks it down into manageable, manageable chunks. Uh, I encourage you, you know, think about of your section, you don't, don't have a 10-page literature review, a one-page methods, two-page results. Um, that's why I give these guidelines. See, there's kind of a balance here. And most papers should come in at 10 to 15 double-spaced pa pages. Um, don't, don't go overboard with your tables and figures. You know, a lot of times people um, present you know, 10 figures that could be combined into one table, that, that kind of thing. So, Think about the, how it's going to look when it's published. Um, the introduction, what is it? It's your literature review, your background. Uh, what you want to really nail here is uh, fairly short. Yeah, I'm going for like two double spaced pages to get really concrete. Um, but what you want to cover is what have others said about the topic? What are the controversies in the field? And then you want to set up a paper to address a specific audience. A lot of papers could be targeted toward primary care versus public health versus psychology, and just on how you set it up. So set it up for your audience, and um, you know make sure that you basically you know what's known, what's not known, what am I going to contribute here with this paper? And even though you might have done an exhaustive literature search and you know written a 10-page literature summary. That's great because now you're an expert in the field, but then you have to cut it all down. Uh, hypotheses, this might seem like, well, everybody knows this, but um, you really need it's a hypothesis or a research question or an objective, explicit statement that says, this is what this paper is about. And believe me, a lot of people submit papers for publication that they don't ever really tell you what the purpose of the paper is. And, and that leads to kind of a meandering results and discussion. And, uh, and, then, and it's a major reason for rejection. If the paper doesn't really come across with a, a strong purpose, um, it doesn't get reviewed well. And, and it's more common than you would expect. Um, the methods is probably the easiest section to write because you're writing about what you did, what you know, and it's pretty cut and dry. I would just say write the methods in very excruciating detail as you're doing your work so you've got a good record. But then just like the extensive literature review, you've got to cut it back. But you've got a good record of what you did. Um, the result is you know, you want to follow, you want to track on your objective or your research questions. Uh, go, you know, talk about the most important findings. You don't go line, some people go line by line. Table one shows 50% were men, you know, 50% were women. You don't do that, uh, although some people do. But you want to um, really focus on what's the most important thing and organize it by study objective. And go in a logical progression from descriptive to bivariate to multivariate analysis. Um, the tables and the figures are really the heart of the paper. They tell what the paper is about. They should really stand alone without referring to text, you know, to, so that the reader doesn't have to go back to the text to figure out what the tables are about. I find that I, I ask authors to revise tables probably 90% of the time, that they come in really incomplete, um, particularly the title, you know, something like Table 1, Description of Sample. That's just not good enough. It needs to just tell who the sample is and something about the time and the context of data collection. Um, don't 
have abbreviations. People do this all the time. They think because they abbreviated something in the text that they can use the abbreviation in, in the table. But, but the standard is I should be able to look, or the reader should be able to look at the table and know exactly what it's about without any questions or having to go hunt up information. Um, discussion. This is where you really interpret your study findings. You don't just repeat them. And you want to highlight on what's the important new information in your paper. Uh, don't overreach, but don't underreach. You know, express some enthusiasm for what you found and why it's important, but don't don't go off, you know, exaggerating too much either. Uh, it's important to describe the limitations. Every study has them. Don't be shy about them because that really takes the wind, if you want to say it that way, out of the the reviewers. Um, so they don't they have less to criticize. But also, be thoughtful about your limitations. A lot of times, they're kind of perfunctory, like um, generalized ability is unknown, period. Well, that's not that informative. But really think a little bit more deeply about your limitations, because that is useful um, not only for setting your study in context, but also for helping other researchers make a better study. Replicate and also go beyond your limitations. If you lay out what 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 could be done better, then the next person should be able to take it to the next level. Okay. So critical analysis, what do your findings mean? What's the take home message? Um, references, you know, this is one of Victoria's pet peeves. You know, I look at the references and if they're a mess, I don't like the authors. <laughs> <laughs> So you know, make sure that you you know you 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 get them all complete. They're not just dangling off, incomplete. Um, use a specific use one, stick with one style. AMA style I like because I call it punctuation light. It's it's easy to do. It doesn't have a ton of commas and periods. Um, but you know whatever format you know of course look at the journal instructions for authors and follow what format they want and. Um, a lot of times you can tell that the paper has been submitted to another journal, but because they've got maybe a social, they maybe they have the APA reference style, which is punctuation heavy, and um, you can tell, oh, it's been rejected someplace else. Now they're coming to us, and you don't really want your reviewers or editors to have that thought about your paper. Um, it doesn't mean that it won't get published. It would never be rejected on that. But it, again, you you just kind of. You know, you don't want to start off with these annoying things. And just for your own benefit, I would caution you not to cite articles you haven't read. It's really tempting to do this because as you're doing a literature review, they mention another study that's exactly what you're looking for. But be careful about that. You know, just go the extra step and go to that paper and make sure that the way it was represented in the first paper you read is correct. Because Sometimes you'll find it's not. And also, um, sometimes you'll find that the, the citation itself is, is incorrect. So that you go back, you make sure that you've got the correct. And then now your paper's done, you're exhausted, you're, you're tired of it, you've got to move on to other things, you're in a big hurry to submit it. But just take a little bit of time, don't rush so much. Um, let it sit for a couple of days, come back, a bunch of uh, errors will jump off the page at you, you know how that happens when you leave things alone and you look at them again. Um, but also make sure that your paper is addressing what I call um, the two questions, so what and who cares. Um, make sure that it's, it, it, you're getting a, a point across that this is some important new information. And then also you can usually reduce and shorten your paper. Um, it's, I find you know, the, you know, there's that quote, I've heard it attributed to anyone from Pascal to Einstein to whoever that, um, I'm not sure who really said it, but I would have written a shorter letter except I was in a hurry. You know, so when we're in a hurry, we're more, we use the passive voice, which is more words. Um, we blather a little bit more. It takes time to edit and be more succinct. Um, so when you're ready, go back and you know, get rid of the passive voice. You know, just, just tighten it up. Get rid of adjective strings. Proofreading, I've kind of covered that. Sometimes it helps to give it to a, good, a friend who's a good writer and, and have them get out the red pen. I find people do that to me and then they, they get offended that I, <laughs> with all the track changes that come to hand, you know. So anyway, it's, improvement is possible. Um, 
so submitting for publication, well, I, I've kind of covered this, but appearance counts. Make it look neat and professional um, because that increases the, our confidence that you will produce a good draft. There's been many papers that you know, I could see that the study was interesting that there is something of interest in the paper, but the paper is kind of a mess, it kind of meanders, and you realize that you're probably going to have to work really hard with these authors to get it up to speed and you know how much effort do I as an editor want to spend actually editing with track changes somebody's paper because they just are not good writers. So um, you know just, just keep that in mind. The, the appearance does count as we I think already know. Um, peer review journals, uh, Julianne did a good job on this. Um, what is a peer-reviewed journal? Maybe I should have started with that. But a, a peer-reviewed journal is one that submits most of its published articles for external review and critique by experts who are not part of the editorial staff. So uh, internal, you know, everything goes through an internal review, um, but then the external peer review is really the hallmark of peer-reviewed journals. As Julian said, we want to avoid non-peer-reviewed journals and uh, avoid predatory journals. There's a lot being talked about these days. There's an interesting article that I just put here in the New York Times telling you some of the weird things the predatory journals do, such as um, uh, invite you to submit your paper, and after they accept it, they send you a bill for $2,500 and then send the bill collector to you. Um, or they'll invite you to be on their editorial board. Probably many of you have had these invitations to, to serve on somebody's editorial board. and. Sometimes you think you know what journal it is because it looks like a journal you know, but maybe there's a slight mis different spelling or a, a different uh, a hyphen that's in there or, or dropped. It turns out it's not the journal you thought it was, and then they put your name on the editorial board mass head and you can't get it off. They refuse to take it down. So there's these really weird things that happen out there. So when you get all these email solicitations to be on somebody's editorial board, I would really proceed with caution. Um, a lot of these predatory journals are open access, and I just want to mention that people have a misconception of what open access is, and it's kind of kind of got a dirty name, a uh, bad name. But like the JABFM is a completely open access journal, and it's uh, peer reviewed, and I think we have high standards. We we follow the guidance of the ICMJE. Um, so open access means that the content is available for free. It does not mean that you're a fly-by-night predatory journal. Just, just note on that one. Okay, so now you've submitted your paper. What happens? A lot of times it gets rejected. Um, and I've been rejected, and everybody's probably been rejected. And um, that's okay. That's just part of the process. And, and some people are so afraid of being rejected that they have trouble submitting uh -huh. papers. I've got some colleagues like that, that the fear of rejection is overwhelming. To be thick and realize that, you know, probably we've all been rejected at least once. Um, the most common reasons for rejection are low interest, originality, importance. Um, it, it could be that the, pay, the, the journal just, it's a great study, but the journal just published a similar one last month, that kind of a thing. Um, Issues of validity, that, you know, that's the research design. Uh, sometimes we feel like um, the paper is not likely to be cited. And that can be a concern in uh, what you um, might decide to accept. Uh, other things that reduce confidence are poor titles. Some people just have these long run-on, vague, redundant titles. Uh, tables are underdeveloped, no abstract, the discussion just kind of limps off into nothing. You know, it doesn't end with a big finish. Remember that so what and who cares? Um, and if it's not clear that the uh, paper provides important new information. So you want, do want to get that out in the, at the end of the paper, that it, it provides important new information. And, okay, so responding to peer review. Don't get upset. I know a lot of people really take this hard, but it's just part of the game, really. Um, and, and you just attack it in a systematic way. And uh, what I do is take the peer review, break it up, number each item. So 
so that you know, you know, this is item number one, item number two. Uh, make a list of each comment. A ask your co-authors and list them to help you. And uh, how are you going to fix the paper? And and also, you want to make a comment to the editorial team on how you address each issue. And then when you do resubmit, you write a, a cover letter, or we call it a rebuttal, explaining how each comment was handled. And the easier you make this for the reviewers. And I mean the editors to comprehend how you revise your paper, the, the, the better it is. Um, like, and here's a recent example that I got. I did get permission from the author to use this. But it's not about the content, but it's just a nice format. See, he went through and he had three reviewers and he numbered all their comments. And he summarized what the comments were, just pasted them into his table, and then on the right hand column, just made a remark and said, you know, good point. We added sentences to the limitation to address this, or be responsible. We've already talked about this, um, that kind of thing. So that that's one way to do it. It, it can be just in, not. It doesn't have to be in a table, but it can be, um, you know, in text form. But you want to be clear that you're identifying each issue and responding to each issue one by one. And, and one thing that people do is they tend to. Sometimes I see they, they tell the editor how what they think about the reviewer's comments, but they don't tell you how they changed their paper, and then we have to send it back and say, well, that's all great, but um, you need to you know insert some of this into your into your revision. Strange. I don't know what that is. Um, so anyway, just to wrap up, uh, good luck with it and stick with it, and don't give up on your rejected papers. Just revise and resubmit them somewhere else. And remember, the, the peer review is a very valuable thing for you because uh, improvement is possible. And um, remember, you know, sometimes people say, well, the reviewers, that, they were stupid. They just didn't understand me. They didn't understand my paper. Well, that's okay, but it probably means if they didn't get it, you probably didn't explain it very well. So just, you know, just don't get upset. And I just say that because I know people do. But just take it as an opportunity to improve what you're doing. And again, here's a list of the resources that Julianne and I covered today, and they were sent out before as well. So that's the end of my talk. I hope that wasn't too elementary, but uh, I'd be happy to go back and respond to any questions. Well, thank you both very much. Um, we'll take questions now, and we do have a question in the chat box by, uh, from Liz Waddell. Um, can you say a little bit more about senior author position? Okay, the senior author position. A lot of times, you know, it depends on how many authors you have. If you have two authors, then it, it doesn't. It's not even there. Um, and three authors, it, it's a way of kind of rank ordering the authors when you have a larger group of authors. So if you have five authors, usually the first author does most of the work. Um, the second author might, is probably very engaged, and then the senior author also, it indicates that, that person had a lot to do with the conduct and reporting of the paper. I'm not sure if that answers your question. It, maybe it doesn't. Um, if, it, if it doesn't, just ask something a little bit more detailed. Liz, if you if you have a more detailed question, uh, please go ahead and just jump on the phone, and we'll we'll give you just a second. Hey, thanks. So I was just wondering if um if the second author position does that indicate that someone put more effort in than the senior author position? Oh, we have a lot of large large groups on paper. I mean, I would say no. But you know, I've never seen much written about this. It, it, this is one of these like um, cultural things about publishing that people talk about. I, I, it's like not in the ICMJE guidelines, I don't think. I'll have to double check. Um, I, I think the second, especially if you have a lot of authors, the second author is an important place also. And the, the senior author is, is important to, to distinguish from all the people in the middle. Okay, thanks. That helps. Okay. <laughs> kind of yep. Any other other questions or thoughts, or you want to share any experiences that might be of interest to the group? You can ask your questions on the phone, or you can uh, you can type them in the chat box. Uh, so Sebastian Tong has a question: How do you order the people in the middle? <laughs> yeah, 
I don't really know. I, I, it's, that's why the, I call it the sticky issue of authorship. It's just a lot of um, things that are, and to a certain extent, doesn't matter. I mean, you, you could alphabetize. At one time, I just alphabetized the people in the middle. So the first author, the second author, they did most of the work, the senior author, and then the people in the middle, they were in alphabetical order. Just because it, it gets hard to really know. Um, and it's best if you lay this out to people um, instead of making, as a senior author, making the decision by fiat. That, that can cause hurt feelings or bad feelings. So I don't know the answer. Okay. The research, so here's a, should a research assistant who is involved in study but not the manuscript still get authorship? That's a really good question. And um, again, you have to use your best judgment. Go back to those three authorship criteria, um, which were that they were, I think they were in, involved in the conception and planning of the study, in the conduct of the study, and in write up of the study. So you've got someone who maybe just was involved in the middle part, the conduct of the study. And I, you know, I would look at to what extent did this person make a contribution? Did they really help? hammer out the methods, what would be the best approach, or were they just strictly a functionary? Um, sometimes data it, collecting. is it just strictly data collecting, or did the person really have to, you know, did the person bring something to the table to help you know, help the study do it, you know, the best it could do, or maybe iron out some problems that were occurring with data collection and come up with a strategy or a solution that made the study more successful? I tend to err on the side of being more inclusive because you don't really have that much to lose by including another name, and sometimes it, you know, it, it, it can be very important to that person and help them build their career. So, like I said, there are those criteria for authorship, and and you want to think how do they re relate to every person in the project. Yeah, I'll just um, just jump in and add too that those of us who who are um, you know, conducting studies, maybe we have a responsibility um, with, you know, with our research assistants to, to allow them to be involved in all those phases and to kind of inform them, you know, that you may want to take the opportunity to be involved in this part of it so that you can be an author on the paper. Um, since many research assistants are trying to, you know, get into graduate school or medical school, whatever it might be. Just a comment. Yep, no, I agree entirely. And, uh, you know, it, like I was referring to, you know, how important it might be to them. Sometimes they don't even know if it's a younger person, you know, that this is the coin of the realm and how it could really help their career in terms of getting into school or that kind of thing. So, so I've got a question. Maybe you could comment on the significance and timing of posters and presentations at conferences. I'm wondering what are your views on these venues for dissemination? Um, I think those are really important uh, opportunities for dissemination, especially um, because that, that should be the first phase of writing your paper or, or getting the first draft of your paper out there. And plus, going to conferences is a great opportunity to meet people and to network, find out new ideas, see what other people are doing. Um, and a lot of times you don't get the funding to go unless you are presenting. So I think presenting at conferences is really important. Um, but I would add that don't, you know, don't, don't just present at conference. If year after year you're just presenting at conferences and you're never submitting a paper for publication, then you need to get out of your comfort zone and move on to the next level because it's really the publications that are going to help you with your career and they help you get funding and they help you get promoted and those things. So and they help yeah. right, they help not to mention as Julian just said they help, you know, advance the field by um, peer reviewed publications in a way that presenting at conferences doesn't. So yes, present at conferences but, you know, make sure that you publish what you present and don't just keep submitting abstracts year after year because some people fall into that trap. Um, next question, can you elaborate more on the difference in citing references in the introduction versus the discussion? So um, I would say that's a good, really good question that a couple things come to mind that when you write the, the introduction, the literature review, it, it's often early on when you're planning the study or you're, you're, it's part of your grant proposal 
and um, again, you're trying to set up your study. What is known? What is not known? What am I going to contribute with my project? That, that's, that's the general order that your literature review sh at the beginning should be. However, when you finish your study, a lot of times a year or two has gone by since you wrote that introduction. So I, I really recommend that you then circle back and do another literature review and get some really updated current references um, in your bibliography so the paper looks fresh and you know, it's up to date on where the field is. But now, so then when you get to the discussion, you're really highlighting what's important in your paper, the most important findings, and you want to put them in the context of the literature. So you may go back to some of the articles in the introduction that were cited, but you may also you know, bring in, you know, our findings are similar to those of so-and-so. Uh, or you know they or they differ. So you're you're putting it. You're doing an interpretation in in the context of of the field, and you know you may have some epidemiology to to set up in at the beginning, and maybe less of that in the discussion. So the discussion really wants to you know set your most important findings in the context of, of the literature. Uh, how important is the cover letter? I would say it's not that important. Um, it's kind of perfunctory. It's good to put some basic statements. Like you know, a lot of times, when people use the cover letter to say, you know, we're submitting our paper and we affirm that we followed the, you know, all authors um, meet the criteria for authorship and agree that to submit. And um, it hasn't been submitted to another journal because that's one of the ethical things I didn't mention before, but it's, it's considered unethical to submit your paper to more than one journal at a time. So you might think, oh, let's just submit it to three journals and see what happens. That, that's a huge no-no, and you can get blacklisted for doing that. So you have to do the serial progression. So a lot of times the cover letter just makes that statement that we're only submitting to your journal right now. Um, so um, and sometimes if, if there's some special piece of information that you want to relay, you would put it in the cover letter. And also a statement, just one or two sentences why the journal would be interested. You know, we believe that the readers of your journal would be interested because our paper addresses X. But I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. Um, I see we're almost out of time. and. Um, I Probably Dr. Werner wants to wrap up. If, are there any other questions now, or feel free to email me. Do we have our emails on here? We did. Yeah, actually, we did. Yeah, we, did. we had many drafts. We had a draft that had our emails on our slide set. Um, but in any case, I think you can find us. Oh, there's one more question, Jim. Do I have time for another question? Yeah, we we actually have till 1:30. Oh, so we're we, we, oh, we have we have a lot of time uh, oh. if there if there are more questions, and, and it looks like there are more. Um, okay, so there is a tremendous emphasis on publishing original work. Should we be spending time publishing reviews of literature, commentaries, etc.? Um, I would say yes. I think everyone's looking, you know, to get a, a few publications a year, just to be really pragmatic here. And some things are take shorter amounts of time. So I, I would say you want to think of a pipeline of publications that you have going. Um, you know, the, the publications of original research, they take a lot longer. So I would encourage you to think of some shorter projects that you can publish, like a commentary. Um, literature reviews are actually fairly difficult to do well. Um, but yes, I, I think that you should think of, of a of a pipeline of publications because some will get out a lot faster than others. And when it's time for your annual review, it's good to have a few pu publications in peer review journals. Okay, um, next question I think is how would you determine how good is the journal? Is not the one that you mentioned asking for huge payments, especially if not well known journals? What about that? So I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, some journals do require some author fees and payments. And you're asking how is that viewed by? Is the question how is that viewed? Um, again, there's the whole predatory journal thing. I mean, for one thing, you want to know what what the the p the fee payment schedule is in advance. Um, what the predatory journals may do is they don't tell you until after they've accepted your paper, and then they 
start dunning you. So, you know, if, if it's stated up front what the fee schedule is, there should not be a fee for submitting your paper. Um, so that would be a red flag. You would, but you want to be aware, it, sometimes there's a fee one, if the paper is accepted. And these are often journals that don't have any external support. So, you know, it does cost money to run a journal, to have the peer review process and to, you know, to do the copy editing, the typesetting. There are legitimate costs. And um, look, I work for two journals. One is the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine, and the ABFM supports JABFM you know, as an open access, no fee journal. Um, the other one is Family Practice, which is published by Oxford University Press. And um, they don't charge any fees, but the content for most articles is not open access until after several months or maybe 12 months. Um, so I'm kind of digressing into my own world, but um, I'm not sure if I answered your question. How would you determine how good is the journal is, is, is one question. I mean, there are journal impact factors, but they're, they're very limited in what they tell us about a journal. Um, impact factors reflect the um, number of citations to the journal's articles over the last two-year period. And impact factors are, um, are favorable to the basic science journals much more than to the clinical type journals. And that's because the basic science journals um, the, the authors are, are citing each other. They're researchers. They're, you know, they're writing papers. They're citing papers. Whereas a lot of the more clinical journals or journals about clinical medicine, they're being read by either clinicians who use them or, um, say, primary care researchers who may be, um, so the clinicians may be implementing, I say use the, they're, they're implementing the information in their clinical practice. Um, and a lot of the researchers may be also implementing um, the findings to improve patient care. But, you know, there, so the, the information is being used in those particular ways to great benefit, but not necessarily being cited, you know. Um, so the, there are these metrics, but they're all very limited in, in what they mean. So I would just encourage you to be aware of, you know, journal impact factors are not that relevant to to journals that publish research that's used by clinicians or used to improve clinical practice. Okay, so I think I've answered all of your questions. Predatory. Well, the predatory, I, I said it about predatory journals. Um, again, they, well, it, it, there's a list, actually, um, in that New York Times article. And I've got the paper here somewhere. Um, it's called Beale's List, B-E-A-L-L-S. And he's this librarian that is, uh, he, he keeps a list of predatory journals, and, and it's in the hundreds. You can look it up and see if the journal you're interested in is on this list, which is one quick and dirty way. But if you go to that New York Times article, it, it tells you about Beale. And the other thing is just, just look at the website. Does it look legitimate? Some of these things are like slapdash. And if they're asking you to pay to submit, that's bad. Um, another question. I understand the impact factors, but in clinical research world, I felt this is not as relevant as much, especially with review articles and case presentation. Um, yeah, review articles tend to get a lot of citations, actually, whereas case presentations don't. Um, so again, if you're a journal that publishes a lot of these, like for the JABSM, we do some case re, um, reports, and those are heavily read, um, but not cited, because they're, they're read by clinicians. So another metric for um, the impact, if you will, of the journal is looking at their, um, their statistics on the readership, which is really hits to the articles on the website. And like for the JFBFM, um, we get the most hits really on the clinical type articles because um, there's a, just, just a lot. So they're having an impact in, the, in that regard. But, but the people who are reading those are not 
usually the same people who are going to be writing articles that cite them. Uh, review articles are a good thing to write if you can, but yeah, you, know, you want to make sure there's not a good Cochrane review or whatever out there. You want to make be sure there's really a need for a particular review article. And I would say make sure it's an evidence-based review where you assess the strength of evidence. <coughs> there's this taxonomy called SORT, strength of I forget what it stands for. S O R T. Somebody help me. Strength of research taxonomy. Yeah, maybe a strength of research taxonomy. But it's been published in several journals and it gives you a strategy for, you know, how do you assess the level of evidence. And so those are the best reviews that are evidence based and assess the strength of the evidence. Okay, here's another one. Uh, what terminal degrees should be listed with the authors? Many of our collaborators have a BA. Well, you know, that depends on the journal. Some journals don't even publish the degrees. And sometimes you might put them on the cover page. But um, I would say, but to answer your question, I mean, they may or may not be included in the final publication. But I, I, I think if the person has a BA, that's fine. Include it. I wouldn't, you know, include like MD and PhD for some people and nothing for another because it's um, a bachelor's degree. So, any questions for Julianne and those exciting web-based portals? That's that's a whole other world out there. I'm just curious to to know if uh, any of our fellows have published in those um, portals and if so, what their experience has been. Maybe I'm going to ask Julian a question. What kinds of work have you published in those portals? Uh, really educational, medical educational research, and also assessing um, evaluation tools. That was particularly a meta portal where I did a systematic review of evaluation tools. Um, the meta portal actually is accepted in terms of what universities view as scholarly you know, for your CVs and mm -hmm. scholarly productivity. And so do you have some DRL too is very good. And do you have to educate your P and T committees about what these are? It depends on your university. Ours is very well educated here. But I know in talking to others, they said they had to share with them and show them the Meta Portal website and show them who the reviewers were mm -hmm. and that helped. But that, I think, in Medit Portal particularly, and if, for those of you in family medicine, and I, I know many of you are, the FMDRL is a very good as well. It does do a very nice job of peer review. Um, but what a, a lot, what happens is people come back from a conference and they upload their PowerPoints and then they leave it alone. And, it's, and that's that's okay. Initially, you really want to publish what you're learning in a peer-reviewed venue. So submit that presentation, write it more formally, and then submit it for peer review to the FMDRL or MedEd portal. And again, many of you I know are teaching residents or students. Um, th these are the venues for that. My MedEd portal publication was educational material as part of a pediatric cost-conscious care curriculum. That's supposed to mirror the adult choosing. We can't get it lower here. Wisely content. Okay. That's perfect. That's what they. So we have we have a fellow who does have this experience. Yes. Good. Here's another. Is it easier to publish in Med Portal versus a journal? The easy part. You, you can't get rejected. The easy part is they have a very structured template. You must answer this. They want paragraphs on this. They want sections on this. And it walks you through um, in a PDF file um, form format that you type in and answer. My advice is to write it out like you would a regular publication, and then you copy and paste into the various sections of what they ask. They, you know, they want summary reports. They want an abstract. There's various sections. So they're not going to do copy editing. You have to kind of get it in the standard format. Correct. Right. Correct. But it gets peer reviewed. People get rejected. Um, so here's another question. At what point of time should we be thinking of publishing into the portal? If we have some set of research articles? I don't understand the so question. So does that mean, why, why, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Why would you wait until you have a set? 
on material. Okay, we're going to come back to that. We're going to wait for, you know, here's a different, we're, we're going to come back to when we get a clarification. So here's from Anne. Um, are the materials copyrighted on the alternative venues, like Meta Portal? Who holds the copyright? After, after five years on the Meta Portal, they'll ask you to re revise, review it. They'll send you, you know, a notification. Has anything changed? Would you like to update this material? And it will go through another peer review process. The other section that the non-peer reviewed, they go off in every year. It's on and then they ask you if you want to keep them on or they take mm -hmm. a lot of stuff off because those are just taken up. Right. A lot of times, sometimes the journals will hold the copyright for a certain period of time right. and then it reverts to the authors. Um, but like JABFM always holds the copyright even though it's an open access journal. The, the society holds the copyright. Um, I, I thought of something else I wanted to mention is that when, um, remember we were talking about impact factors versus readership. Now that most journals are online, you know, readership, which is hits on your articles, is really important for the journal to know, but also for the authors to know. And a lot of um, journals have what they call these author data centers where you can go and see how many hits are on your papers. And then this, um, when you're going out for P and T, you know, sometimes you're asked, well, how many citations do you have to your paper? Again, depending on the type of publication, it, it may be, you know, very influential and in being used, uh, like to improve patient care, but maybe it's not being cited quite as much. But so keeping track, being aware that you can get information on the hits, or the, and that's referred to as the readership of your article, is really important. And um, secondly, you can you can promote hits to your article by you know, disseminating the link to your article, not the PDF. When you send, we really try to educate people and, um, to not, not distribute PDFs of your paper because then you don't know how many people are reading it or using it. It's much better for you and for the journal to you know, send out the link so that the hits can be tracked. And Julianne wants to okay. make a comment. I want to comment on you getting involved in reviewing papers yourself. It is a very, very useful skill to have. It makes you a better writer. Mm -hmm. You're reviewing papers critically. It helps you in your own writing efforts. But early on in my career, I did a lot of it, I think, too much. So I'm cautioning you to not do that. It takes you away from spending time on your own writing and publishing. But it was very, very useful to mm -hmm. really understand what the journal is looking for and mm -hmm. the format. And you're seeing what the other reviewers are picking up that maybe you missed. So I'm encouraging you to, if you've never reviewed a paper, um, mm -hmm. it's also a very useful scholarly service for you to engage in. I, I agree entirely. And I would encourage you, like the JABFM had, on its website, it has a form where you can volunteer to be a peer reviewer. And I would encourage you all to sign up. And you list your areas of expertise, and then you be, you're asked occasionally to review a paper. You can, of course, always decline, and sometimes you should decline. Um, but like Julian said, it really helps you advance your own scientific knowledge and your understanding of the peer review process. And most journals, um, they, they send the reviewers the copy of the decision letter, and so you see the decision and, and also what the other reviewers said. And that can be very enlightening to see how you are doing compared to the others. And, and, and sometimes you address totally different things. You, know, you might have content expertise. The other reviewer might have methodological expertise. But it's really nice to get that big picture. And it's a great form of personal develop, you know, professional development. And plus, you can put it on your annual activity summary as professional service. So I, um, that's a really good comment, suggestion for everybody. Okay, here's a comment. Reviewing is also a good exercise in practicing constructive versus destructive feedback, which is why some rejection can be more difficult than others. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, sometimes I write a review and what I really think, and then I, I go back and try to be nice. Um, because, you, you know, your first, sometimes you, it's when you're rushing. It's like it's easier to be um, more <coughs> negative when you're rushing. Just like you get verbose and it's too long when you're rushing. Um, but I think it's 
recently I reviewed a uh, an educational project, educational research project from a medical student, and it was just needed so much work. And they asked me to be the second reviewer because the first reviewer just slam dunk this thing terribly. And I wanted to help this student out, so I was benevolent and spent a lot of time. And the editor wrote me and thanked me for that, that it was much more helpful to the editor, to the obviously to the student and their team. Um, so you have to be <laughs> careful mm -hmm. with some of those. The editor wouldn't allow that necessarily, would they? Do you see all the reviewers' comments? Yeah, um, sometimes I edit them. Uh, sometimes, you know, I I should have, but I miss the opportunity. Um, when when you're a peer reviewer, you're really giving advice to the editor. You shouldn't say things like reject this paper or accept this paper, um, because that's not that's not your role and it's not your decision. Um, and then sometimes when things are overly harsh, I, I edit them out. I think we may have missed a couple of uh, questions there that yeah. were asked at 1.09 p.m. and 1.11 p.m. there in the chat box. Okay, I see. How do you find the hit statistics on your own articles? Again, there's an, an uh, go, go to the journal's author data center. And um, sometimes you have to uh, enroll in that, um, and, and you'll get information. And if not, I would just contact the editorial office and, and ask them for more information on how to get that information. And there's another one, um, do you own the content as the author? Um, and it, it, that, that depends on who owns the copyright. It's all about the copyright. Some journals um, leave the copyright with the authors, and other, other journals hold the copyright. So it just, it's like a journal by journal thing. Um, here's a question. Are the materials copyrighted on the alternative venues? Oh, oh, we answered that. I'm sorry. OK, so I'm going back down. Let's see what I missed. Okay. Um, with regards to dissemination, how do journals view services like ResearchGate? Does that help or hurt traffic? You know, I actually don't know. Um, we've d I don't use ResearchGate because I, I use ResearchGate, and I think it helps. Okay. Tell, tell I've, about I've gotten a lot of hits, and it tracks how many hits, who's reading your papers. Mm -hmm. You can correspond with them. Um, it's surprising as soon as I joined. Okay. I get those emails. I, I guess I'm kind of late in my career, and so I, I think if, if you're um, junior. more junior, that it probably is a good thing. I, I just I, I, I plead in ignorance. Yeah. I think it helps. So, can you describe for people who don't know what exactly it is? A research gate is a, a portal. <laughs> I'm like the portal. The portal here. Screen. Yeah. Um, it's a portal that where you place your, uh, it's, a, it's a web of science tech that's another mm -hmm. portal. Mm -hmm. Google Scholar is another portal. It, it's a holding tape for your publications, for your scholarly activity. And you put it out there. And so similar to LinkedIn, it engages with all other researchers who all your other authors are connected with you when they publish, when they get cited. So it's all interconnected and interlinked by topic and by authorship. And are so your articles posted as a link or as a PDF? Uh, both. So don't put it can your, be. Yeah. So I would say you know don't put your PDFs up there. You know send them to your link. Yes. It takes you takes you to the journal site. Right. It w which will count your hits. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Maybe I have enough. Okay, I think did we get all the questions? Really good questions. Yeah, those are good questions. I think we have uh, addressed all that you have addressed all the questions. If there are any other questions, please get them in the chat box right away. Um, would it be okay if our fellows contact you by email if they have questions that come up for themselves uh, after the presentation? Come into the chat box or. We had that yeah. slide. I yeah, we had, yeah, we had a slide with our email, but we lost it. Oh, OK. Um, however you want to do that, that's fine. Um. OK, great. 
Uh, well, this has been really enlightening, and it's just a, a great uh, opportunity to talk with folks who know so much about uh, disseminating uh, research information. And um, uh, you know, to have the time of a, of a busy author or a busy editor as well um, is something we don't often experience. So thank you both so much, Dr. Neal and Dr. Binyanda, for being with us today. Um, Again, we will be sending an email out to all the fellows with up-to-date information about our convocation, uh, which will take place again uh, in July. Um, and please uh, uh, contact either Amanda Ross or myself if you have any questions about making your uh, reservations and accommodations for that. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.